Welcome to the Musician's Gear Podcast, where we talk about all things music, gear, and various other topics. I'm your host, J.D. Jackson, and I hope you enjoy. Have you ever wondered where the first instrument was created? What type of instrument was it? In what time period and human civilization was it created? That and so much more will be covered in today's topic for discussion. So let's go back to as far back as we have in history and our records for musical instruments and when they were created. Every known civilization has had music of some kind. The human voice is as old as the species itself. And a recorder-like instrument or object crafted from the thigh bone of a bear may have been uh, made as long ago as 50,000 years ago by Neanderthals, living in what, what is now known as Slovia in Eastern Europe. The earliest indisputable musical instrument, though, this is one that historians agree upon, a kind of flute made from the wing bone of a vulture dates from about 34,000 BCE and was found in what is now known as southwestern France. The ancient civilizations of Europe and Samaria, which emerged between 4,000 and 3,000 BCE, left behind many images of people singing and playing instruments, particularly in connection with religious rituals. Music in, biblical, in the biblical world. So, in the Bible, it talks a lot about musical instruments, and the Bible uh, goes back many, many years of ancient human civilization throughout times. The Old Testament makes repeated references to music. Immediately after crossing the Red Sea and Exodus from Egypt, Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron, used a, uh, a tam tambourine to lead the Israelite women in song and dance to praise God for delivering her people. That was in Exodus 15, 20 through 21, if you're curious. The young David cured Saul's melancholy, melancholy by playing the harp in Samuel 1, 16, 14 to 23. That's where that's found. And is one of the earliest recorded instances of music theory and music therapy. David went on to write many of the Psalms, and as king of Israel, he played a key role in establishing the order of worship, including the singing of Psalms and hymns, which is pretty interesting. So if you're someone that's religious or not religious, all of our hymns that we sing nowadays in um, different religions, a lot of it is dated back to um, King David. The temple he envisioned in Jerusalem, completed by his son Solomon, but destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BCE, is reported to have been attended by 4,000 instrumentalists. And that's in um, Chronicles, oh, 1 Chronicles uh, 23.5. And uh, a big parade of 288 singers a passage that reveals the importance of music in worship describes at the moment when the Ark of the Covenant was brought into the temple, the singers arrayed in fine linen with cymbals, harps, and lyres stood on the east altar with a hundred and twenty priests who were trumpeters. And it was the duty of the trumpeters and singers to make themselves heard in unison and praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. As I mentioned before, obviously in the Bible, they talk a lot about early instruments. But way even before um, even the Bible, it talks about different instruments that were used for, you know, King David 
also um, Miriam, the, you know, Moses' sister. And that's just what we have record of. That doesn't mean instruments. That's when instruments started. That's when they started being used and in, implemented into society. They've been in society for a long time. That's just what we have record of. So let's talk about when the harp was first created. The earliest evidence of the harp is found in ancient Egypt uh, circa in 2500 BC. They were shaped like bows and angular and had very few strings because of the lack of the column that could not support much of uh, string tension. So in early instruments, they couldn't get the tension tight enough to um, basically make very many strings on these instruments um, and different uh, pitches and frequencies just because of the materials they were using at the time. And that was the ancient Egypt um, harp. That's when that was created. Later, they also have the Irish harps. Now, this talks about the Irish harps a little bit and how they were created. This was in 800 AD when they first started coming around. The frame harp or the harp is like a straight four pillar or a column of the modern sense. First appeared in medieval Western Europe in the 8th to 10th century AD. Although there are very few remaining in existence, Art from that time indicates that they were utilized about 10 or 11 strings. So they would use quite a few strings, actually, which that was a lot more than, you know, previous instruments. I mean, nowadays we only use, for most guitars even, six strings. Now they can go up to 12 and even more than that. But commonly we use strings, uh, string instruments have about six, seven, eight at the most, maybe, uh, strings. Uh, diatonic harps. This was in 1800 AD. Harps in continental Europe differed from Irish harps in that the uh, four pillar was thinner and less curved. The neck was more slender and it curved upward to meet the end of the column. Referred to as a Renaissance harp, they typically had a uh, 24 or more gut strings, which were fixed to the soundboard uh, with braised wooden pegs. By the end of the 17th century, they typically had staved sound bodies and straight four pillars. You can see there's lots of different variations of the harp as well. And even in the Bible, they talk about, you know, David playing a harp and things like that. So, it, it just goes to show you just because we have we have a, a decent amount of history, a different uh, knowledge of what instruments were like. We still barely touching that probably the iceberg of what was going on in civilization with instruments, because over time, you know, they just get frail and break. And then we don't have any kind of history of that. And, you know, even during Nathanderthal's times, you know, they probably didn't keep good records, obviously, of instruments that they had you know it could be as easy as like some kind of percussive instrument which i'm sure you know going back a long time ago was a really big thing so um but it keeps going on talking about other types of harps and we won't go through them all but let's go to is it double action yeah let's go to the double action pedal harps so now these harps have pedals on them, um, similar to why you have pedals on a guitar, or not a guitar, a piano, excuse me. Um, the double action pedal harps in 1810 AD. The only drawback to the single act action harp was that not every key could be achieved for playing. In 1810, a double action pedal harp was patented in which was seven pedals could be depressed twice and each string passed through two prong discs instead of just one. When a pedal was depressed into the first notch, the upper disc turned partially and firmly held the string so that it sharpened the semitone 
while the bottom disc turned partially but did not touch the string. The sharpen to sharpen another semitone, the pedal was depressed again into a lower notch, and the bottom disc further to grip the string even more. Aside from mechanical improvements, this system is still used today. So that that's pretty cool that it shows, and that's the last one that they have on this website, which is harp.com. If you want to read more about harps, you can also, I think, get lessons here and whatnot. But um, that same kind of uh, mechanical idea is used today in pianos and other types of harps. So that's uh, pretty interesting, but it shows you that harps go way, way back, further than even they say here, but the, the furthest back that we have evidence of um, that is undisputable is ancient Egypt harps of uh, 2500 BC. So let's talk about liars now. And no, I'm not talking about people that lie. I'm talking about the instrument, the lyre, which is spelled L-Y-R-E. The lyre was invented by Sumerians of ancient Iraq around 3200 BCE. Its design was developed from the harp by replacing the, the single bow shape into two upright joined arms by a crossbow. And the strings, instead of joining the sound box directly, were made to run over a bridge attached to the box. The bow lyre is one of three excavated from the Royal Cemetery of Ur. Each lyre had a different animal head protruding from the front of the sound box to denote its pitch. So that's how you could distinguish between these different uh, lyres. A bull lyre, lyre was bass, which makes sense. The heifer lyre was tenor, and the stag lyre was alto. All three were made of wood, and the bull lyre stood roughly about 1.2 meters high. The sound box was defined by a broad border, a mosaic in the shell, lap, lap, lapis lazuli, and red paste. And this border continued on to the rectangular upright arms. The strings were tied to the crossbow and strung down over the bridge to connect at the base of the sound box. Researchers believe the notes constituted the same scale of Queen Shabaid's harp and were achieved by the tension of the strings rather than the length. So that's kind of cool. That kind of explains what a lyre is and how it came from uh, basically um, a harp and it, it looks it looks kind of similar but like it said it is different um, it does have uh, a bridge which a lyre or a harp doesn't have a bridge so that's a big distinguishing difference there let's move on now to because we could talk about these instruments and you know the many various uh, different styles they had of the same instrument and models but let's now go to, which is one of my favorite, it's not an instrument I own yet, but it's an instrument I definitely want to own at some point, and that is a lute. I'm a guitar player, and a lute basically is like one of the first guitars, if you will. It's where guitars come from, um, those and ouds, which we'll talk about later. The origin of the lute cannot be pinpointed to a specific date, but is, is a close relationship to the Abr uh, Arab Oud, which is without doubt, meaning they're very related. The Oud has a pear-shaped body with a bowed back made of numerous ribs, thin strips of wood, a wooden soundboard, rosettes, um, decorative sound holes, and plucked gut strings, and a peg head that is bent back in a curved shape. The name Al Oud literally means the wood and was most likely used to distinguish instruments with wooden soundboards from those with soundboards made of animal skin, which would make a lot of sense. Examples of Ouds first appeared in illustrations and manuscripts in the pre-Islamic 
uh, Arabic Peninsula in six in the sixteenth century or the sixth century. The earliest evidence of the Arab oud in Europe can be found in numerous carvings and depictions dating back to the ninth century, when it was introduced by the the Moors to Spain. However, however, it is not until the thirteenth century that the Western oud can be distinguished from the Arab oud in iconology. So basically it was saying there's art out there that shows depictions of these instruments, which is evidence that they were using those and they had been created for a while um, during that time. But that doesn't necessarily um, give them a specific date on when they were started to be created. Um, so they have carvings all the way back to the ninth century. Um, but they think it was the thir 13th century is kind of what they say was when they were actually being used. So the more um, evidence we get, the more archaeology we do, the more history we unveil, the, the more evidence we'll have on when these instruments were actually used and how far back they go. All right, so now moving on to uh, still string instruments. That's a really big thing. But um, something that is known for the sound of the Baroque period, and that is the harpsichord. The harpsichord is a keyboard instrument in which the strings are plucked rather than hit with a hammer. So that's one of the reasons they sound just very plucky, if you will, is because you're literally you're plucking the strings instead of hitting it with a hammer like a piano has done, which is a mechanism that the piano does, the hammers. The distinct, uh, distinct, distinctive sound of the harpsichord creates an almost immediately association with the Baroque period, which is true. The earliest reference to such instruments date back to about 1400 or the 1400s. The oldest uh, surviving harpsichord um, date from the 1500s, which by that time, instruments complex mechanism had been perfected. The harpsichord became uh, very popular throughout Europe. Notable centers of production appeared in Italy, Flanders, France, Germany, and England. The instruments could vary slightly from each other with different configurations for keyboards, foot pedals, and hand stops. The cases of housing the mechanisms were very exquisite works in themselves, featuring inlays, paintings, and other fine sources of decorations. The plucked strings of the harpsichord have a rich sound whose clarity informs the complex uh, melodies of the Baroque period. Almost every Baroque composer wrote for the harpsichord as either a solo or uh, uh, basically a duo instrument. Demand for the harpsichord remained steady until the 18th century when it gradually was replaced by the forte piano and then by the modern day piano. The transition was largely uh, large, uh, largely complete by the early 19th century. In the 20th century, the growing interest in historical instruments sparked a revival for the harpsichord, um, which is true. I know lots of people that are interested in the harpsichord again. Uh, if I could own one, I would. They're pretty expensive and very uh, delicate instruments in comparison to the piano. But if I can ever own one, I figure why not? All right. Moving on to kind of the Renaissance period. Um, a notable date for the Renaissance period in the acoustic guitars development in 1488, when a German book that contained 38 prints of an unknown author, each of which depicted uh, a figure of death holding stringed instruments at the time. These include the lute, uh, Villali, and the Renaissance guitar. Two Renaissance guitars feature in the second set of illustrations, which confirm the instrument's existence in 1488. It wouldn't 
properly emerge until the 16th century, however. Around this time, the, a fretted and plucked Spanish string instrument containing five or six strings was starting to come to for, um, for fruition. This instrument was called the uh, violella, which was essentially a flat-backed version of the lute. It rose in prominence in the kingdom of Aragon. That can't be right, Aragon. Aragon. No, that's what it says. Okay. Uh, northeastern Libria, Libya and was played primarily by the aristocrats, like a large guitar. It had six or seven double course, courses of strings and was tuned like a lute. So the tuning would have been G, C, F, A, D, G, for those that care. And was the earliest string instrument relating directly to the modern day acoustic guitar. And now let's go and talk about the classical guitar. The classical, uh, classical period was a golden age for the guitar. During the Baroque period from 1600 to 1750, five coarse guitars were the norm. However, come to the late 18th century, these were abandoned in the favor of six string guitars. Soon, these two would be abandoned in favor of six string counterparts. Between 1730 and 1820, a new generation of guitar composers and performers became stars of the time, most notably in Spain. So, Spain is kind of known for the first immersion of where guitar players became rock stars, if you will. You know, like they at that time were stars, you know, playing these instruments and becoming, you know, prolific at them and uh, basically becoming really good musicians on that instrument. You know, way before this, um, especially during um, Beethoven's time, you know. The instrument of the rock stars was one piano, but also violin. Viol if you're a good violinist, which still is kind of the case today, because it's it's a hard instrument to master, you're noted as a really good musician and um, performer. Um, basically, it goes on to talk about um, what fingers were used for different things um, and how that has changed. And then during eventually leading into the Romantic period around 1850, a Spanish guitar um, transfor uh, maker transformed the guitar structure. He owned a guitar shop where he constructed his own guitars. From there, he made several critical alterations. Uh, first, he increased the size of the guitar's body to increase the volume, the amplification of it. He also fitted it with a lighter, thinner, and larger soundboard, which was arched in both directions. Um, this innovation obviously changed the guitar quite a bit as they continued to basically fine tune the guitar and the sound that can produce and the strings and the shape that they used. Um, and nowadays, we you know, people have just completely ran with it. Uh, Martin, a German-born American, established C.F. Uh, C. Martin and Company in 1833. Around a decade later, between 1842 and 1843, he created what is believed to be the world's first X-braced guitar. And basically what that means is on the inside of the guitar, there's support beams and an X in the inside of it, right below the sound hole. And that's that's how they built it um, on the inside of the guitar. You don't really see it um, unless it's ripped apart. Then later, in 1902, um, American Luther Orvin H. Gibson founded a company in Calzamoza, Mi Michigan. This company is known today as Gibson Brand or Gibson Brands Incorporation, and is one of the world's largest, most famous guitar manufacturers, which is true. 
Um, every t- guitar player I know, or at least most guitar players I know, they want to have a Les Paul Gibson, beautiful guitarist. A uh, Gibson is credited with creating the arch top guitar, which refined volume, tone, and vibration. The arch top had violin-like sound holes, an adjustable bridge, and a curved body. These features enabled it to vibrate freely and produce a louder sound. It's a little surprise, therefore, that it was later adopted by jazz, country, and swing musicians. Then later, even after that, during the Beatles eras, um, in the 1960s and beyond, believed to be one of the world's first electric acoustic guitars, the Gibson J160E became one of the one of the faces of the 1960s rock and roll. It was made famous by the Beatles' television appearances and is the only guitar to feature on every one of the Fab Four's albums. It is an action in the music video for this boy. So if you want to watch a music video, um, This Boy by the Beatles, you can see that guitar. And then it goes on. We can go further and further in guitar for a long, long time. But this just gives you an idea of kind of where instruments came from and how they developed over time. It's quite interesting how we know a lot about today's instruments, but maybe very little about where everything came from. I mean, the earliest instrument that we have found is some kind of bone flute or um, recorder, you know, woodwind instrument instead of some kind of stringed instrument like we have been talking a lot about which is string instruments are very popular personally i'm a string instrument guy as you can see with the guitars behind me um but i've always wanted to learn how to play other instruments i mean when we're all kids at least when i was growing up one of the first um, experiences i had with any type of instrument was either a harmonica or a recorder and they teach kids oh you know teach you basic stuff in there for music and when they're first teaching kids how to play music when they're young they'll give them a recorder and teach them just how to you know play Mary Had a Little Lamb or some kind of Christmas song or some kind of traditional song or you know something along those lines and we could like I said go into this for hours and hours down the rabbit hole of instruments and how beautiful and various they are and how many different styles of instruments there are using very similar techniques and methods like you just using strings versus um you know some kind of cylinder to blow into or percussion there's so many things in percussion we could talk about as well but i think uh what we have went over was a good discussion just talking about early instruments and kind of how they developed over time and to kind of where we're at now it's quite fascinating and I've always wanted to uh, dive even more into studying just how they're created like being a manufacturer of guitars and uh, violin and lutes and percussion instruments and piano I think that would be super fascinating to do so maybe one day I'll be lucky enough to to study in that uh, fashion but anyways we're going to end there I hope you guys enjoyed this discussion Um, and hopefully you learned something or found something fascinating. Uh, Let me know um, either, you know, um, on my social media or in the comment section on YouTube, depending on where you're listening to this, um, what your favorite topic was, your favorite instrument, and maybe something you learned. And until next time, guys, keep rocking on, and I'll see you next time.